Broadcasting from the Prairie Sportsman Studios. Presented by OnX. Know where you stand with OnX. <clears throat> We're not just a radio show anymore. Heck yeah. This is Sporting Journal Radio. That's right. Welcome to the show. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thanks for tuning in on this station right here by downloading the podcast, watching this on YouTube, or streaming it on demand at sportingjournalradio.com. That's Dan Amundsen right over there. Dan, how you doing? Hey, doing well. Welcome to the show. We got an, <clears throat> a lot of important things to talk about this week, and a lot of it deals with water conservation, uh, cleaning the water, taking care of the ecosystem, taking care, just being responsible for yourself and responsible for the sustainability of our most important fisheries on the planet. Scott Hayde is going to be joining us today. He is the Sporting Outreach Director for Businesses for Bristol Bay. He's going to be talking about a deadline that's coming up that you're going to want to know about September 6th. If you want to speak out against the mine project, the copper mine project, the pebble mine up in Bristol Bay, September 6th is when you need to comment by at stoppebblemindnow.org. Scott Hayde is going to explain what that mine means. If you don't know the story, you probably heard about it. If you want more details about it, Scott Hayes going to break it down on why this mine should be stopped and and just the economic impact of the fishery versus the mine and how big the economy is just based on this fishery compared to what the mine would be and, and how dangerous that mine could be for the fishery. We'll talk about all that coming up later in the show. Also, Joe Henry will be joining us to talk about Keep It Clean. And it won't just be Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods, but it'll also be Robin Dwight from Red Lake and Ann Bruciani Lyon from Mille Lacs talking about uh, this coalition that they're building to clean up either after yourselves to get you to clean up after yourselves when you're ice fishing or to provide some opportunities to throw away your garbage, uh, dispose of human waste, things like that. Problems that you run into when you're on the lake, when you're ice fishing with so many people ice fishing and spending more time out on the ice, the lakes are getting trashed and the shorelines are getting trashed and we can't have that happen because if we don't take care of it ourselves, they'll start mandating changes for us and nobody likes that. So clean up after yourself or else you're going to get told you're going to have to do this to, to keep these lakes clean. So Keep It Clean is an organization, a coalition of these, uh, these areas trying to keep our lakes clean. We'll find out more about that coming up later in the show. And also Garrett Sphere from Slab Seeker Fishing will join us to talk about where to go target panfish right now in Otter Tail Lakes country. Dan, who is this week's show brought to us by? This week's show is brought to us by Haybill Heights Campground and Resort on Devil's Lake. Book a trip to Devil's Lake at haybillheights.com. Otter Tail Lakes Country. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. Lake of the Woods. Lake of the Woods is the walleye capital of the world. Plan a trip for this fall or even winter at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Camp Grayling. Fish Camp Grayling in Saskatchewan. Walleye Pike. Lake Trout and Grayling. Fish Camp Grayling this summer or next summer on X, nor you stand with on X. Mid-Migration Outfitters, come hunt waterfall at heated 10-man pits and comfortable blinds. Learn more info at midmigrationoutfitters.com. And Prairie Sportsman, the new season is wrapped up. Watch episodes anytime at the Prairie Sportsman YouTube channel or check your TV guide for rerun times. Yeah, we got a great new season coming up in January. You can watch it on, uh, I think we're on s- in seven states with with. Uh, Prairie Sportsman and on 12 stations, something like that. So uh, watch for it coming on Pioneer PBS is our flagship out of Granite Falls, or you can watch it on the Prairie Sportsman YouTube channel or at prairiesportsman.org. Well, hunting seasons are are here in some areas, and I know people are off. I've seen uh, people off caribou hunting in Alaska. I've been seeing pictures of big game all over, and then uh, obviously early Canada goose seasons. And then in Minnesota, the dove season will be kicking off September 1st. And doves are the most abundant game bird in the United States, and they've been hunted in the South forever. I mean, there's there's longstanding family traditions for dove opener. But in Minnesota, we reopened the season in 2004. So it was closed for about 50 years in Minnesota, and then it reopened in 2004. I think a lot of it had to do with Minnesota. You know, a lot of the problems we have in Minnesota is we're a nesting state for a lot of migratory birds. So we ended up having more restrictive uh, uh, seasons and bag limits and things like that. All the guys down south got to have all the fun. Uh, we ended up having more restrictions because we're creating a lot of the birds up here. But that's changing a little bit. We're opening some things up. Um, morning doves mate for life, but we'll find a new mate if theirs dies. They'll build a nest in a couple of days. The female will lay two eggs, and then they take turns 
uh, incubating, incubating the eggs. The, the mother and the father both take turns doing the incubating. After two weeks, the eggs hatch. The parents will care for the young for a couple of weeks. Then they're on their own because the parents are getting down to business once again. It's kind of interesting that doves will they'll raise two to three, two to three uh, uh, families, two to three broods per year here in Minnesota. And in some of the warmer climates down south, they'll actually raise five to six broods. So they're almost like rabbits, just constantly just like, get a room, you guys. Jeez, making all sorts of babies, which is great. Uh, doves will feed on seeds, fruits, and insects in small grain, like wheat. We see them in wheat fields all the time. Then they move on to gravel roads and ditches to eat that gravel uh, to chew up their food. So they'll store those seeds in their crop, and then they eat the gravel to kind of chew up their food for them. Morning doves is kind of an interesting factoid, Dan. Morning doves can eat brackish water. Eat brackish water. They can drink brackish water. It's interesting to eat water. Yeah. They uh, almost half the salinity of seawater without becoming dehydrated like humans do. So uh, that's one reason why morning doves survive in the desert. Every year, hunters harvest more than 20 million morning doves, but it remains, they remain one of our most abundant birds. The U.S. population is estimated at 350 million birds. The oldest known morning dove was a male, 30 years, four months old, when he was shot in Florida in 1998. So that means he was banded in Georgia in 1968. And lastly, uh, they're delicious. You get about three, two to three ounces of meat off of a morning dove. And to put that in perspective, I found some website out of New York that did this. The edible portion of one dove equals 10 large shrimp, one chicken leg, two chicken wings, two and a half wieners, or three sausage patties, or one bratwurst. So a morning dove is equivalent to eating one bratwurst for uh, meat meat size all right morning dove hunt dates uh september 1 to november 29 minnesota one half hour before sunrise to sunset you can shoot 15 a day and the possession limit is 45 all right we got a lot to get to including uh keep it clean uh the organization happening here uh, in minnesota and wanting to expand and then we're going to talk about alaska with uh scott Hayde when we come back on sporting journal radio 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. Well, if you're living somewhere in the reach of this show right here, at least the broadcast reach in Minnesota, Dakotas, Wisconsin, the upper Midwest area, you're you're well aware of the Boundary Waters and the proposed mining uh, that that uh, the mining operation that's been proposed up there, Twin Metals, and the dangers that that could pose for the watershed up there. Well, something similar is happening in Alaska. Uh, The pebble mine construction in Bristol Bay, Alaska. Uh, in 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 2008, there was a estimation that it was a, it was quite quite the ore deposit, maybe the second largest of its type in the in the world. The project would employ a lot of people. It would bring a big big economic impact to the area. Um, there's just a lot of things about this. You know, that it's always a tough thing when you talk about mining because if you it, it can provide a lot of jobs, but you wonder where the balance is to what the impact on the environment would be and the issue in alaska is what it'll do to that watershed and all five eastern pacific salmon species spawn in bristol bay's freshwater tributaries the bay is home to the world's largest commercial sockeye salmon fishery this is a big deal and uh, the epa asked for clean water act protection on parts of the bay in 2021 which would essentially block this mine project and uh, that's what we're going to talk about today our guest is scott Hayde. he's a sporting outreach director for businesses for bristol bay and you can tell me a lot more about this project i just know uh kind of kind of what's going on up there but i would like to get into the details a little bit and just talk about what impact this will have on on, on this fishery, because obviously this fishery is has a huge economic impact as well, not just for uh, the businesses there, but just for anglers, people that like to eat salmon, and of course, people that rely on it for, uh, you know, f- uh, for eating it every day, people that live there. Um, Scott, how, where are we at right now in the, in this project, and what, what are the odds of stopping it? 
Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show to talk about a really important issue. Um, we are right now nearing the conclusion of uh, a long process that the EPA has undertaken with the Clean Water Act that would protect uh, the Bristol Bay region, a, a segment of the Bristol Bay region, which, uh, as you noted, is a pretty big and important uh, wild salmon fishery. Uh, I'll just give you a quick backstory on where Bristol Bay is. The Bristol Bay region is uh, it, southwest Alaska, roughly 200 miles southwest of Anchorage, and it's remote. You can only get there by flying or uh, or by by water. And in this region, uh, you have got a number of major salmon producing watersheds, and this area is responsible for about half the global supply of wild sockeye salmon. Wow. That, sound, that, that, that sounds pretty big, and indeed it is. Um, over the last uh, 10 years, I think the average return is upwards of 40 million fish, but that average each year is moving up because for the last several years, Bristol Bay has set uh, records for the overall sockeye return. Last year in 2021, the uh, sockeye return was 66 million fish, and that's an absolutely enormous amount of, uh, of, of protein. You know, like I said, over half the world's supply of wild, wild sockeye salmon comes from Bristol Bay. So you can go to, you know, Cub Foods, you can go to hy V markets, you know, some of the big chains in the Midwest, and you will find wild Bristol Bay sockeye salmon in their seafood areas. So um, this year, the numbers are even more staggering. This year, as of July 31st, when I believe Alaska Department of Fish and Game kind of stopped counting, they were at 78 million plus sockeye salmon came back to Bristol Bay. So this is a fishery that is unprecedented. It's, it's unmatched on planet Earth. And it's a fishery that has been so well managed and has such productive habitat that they have been commercial fishing this area for 130 plus years. Uh, sport fishing has gone on there for half a century. And uh, before any of those, uh, the native folks of the region have been depending upon these runs of salmon for you know, millennia for their, for, for their entire existence. So the fishery is estimated to be worth $2.2 billion every single year, and it employs 15,000 people mm. in that fishery. So it's both an amazing ecological resource um, as well as an economic powerhouse. Yeah. So, I mean, that's usually the big argument for some of these mines is what it's going to do economically for the region. But uh, it sounds like that fishery is a bigger benefit economically there, obviously. Well, most people do tend to agree with that. And the, the overwhelming sentiment in the region, you know, the folks who've been promised heaven and earth uh, for if you let us build this mine, this is what it'll do for you. The overwhelming sentiment in the region is and has been for 15, 20 years, no thanks. We are just fine with the way things are right now. We don't want to risk what we have for the potential uh, that this mine could possibly bring someday. So, uh, you know, the region sentiment is extremely uh, against building the mine and in favor of protecting the fishery. And in Alaska, a state which is generally pretty favorable toward resource development projects, uh, even statewide, the majority of people uh, don't think that the pebble mine in Bristol Bay is worth the risk. So it's pretty much an outlier when you talk about Alaska big conservation battles. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why most people live in Alaska, right? To be able to live off the land a little bit and enjoy it. And anytime there's a risk to their way of life, they're not going to like it. And, and talk about that risk just a little bit. Like what, why, what does this mine do and what is the potential danger from this mine to the, to the fishery? Okay. Well, for starters, we've already touched on, this is a remote region. There are very few roads in the region. Um, you have to fly to get out there. Uh, the, construct, the, the construction of the mine would entail an enormous amount of infrastructure for starters. You're talking a deep water port on Cook Inlet where the, uh, where the mine would bring their 
product to. Uh, you would have to have a pipeline from there that would go um, around or across Lake Iliamna, which is the biggest freshwater lake in Alaska, out to the mine site, which is on the north side of Lake Iliamna. So um, you would have a road corridor that would have to get punched through um, all the way out to the site. It would require a power plant, and this is pretty, this is pretty unbelievable. You'd, you'd, they'd need a power plant, and the one that they're proposing would be large enough to power more than the city of Fairbanks, Alaska, which is the second biggest city in Alaska. Wow. So all of that infrastructure is number one, and those the roads and everything, you're crossing dozens and dozens and dozens of rivers and streams that, that support this enormous salmon resource. You know, salmon are anadromous fish, they go to the ocean, they come back a few years and they return to the stream that they, uh, that they respond in. So those are the risks just for starters. Um, the mine itself, the company has proposed uh, what what we like to refer to as kind of like a starter mine. Um, the, the, the deposit we've touched on is pretty darn large, but they are proposing, hey, let's just build a little mine right now to start with. And then uh, they feel it's probably easier to get a small mine permitted than a large one. And once, if they were ever able to, get that permitted and into operation, then of course, they're not going to stop with the small mine. They will keep going till they develop the full extent of that of that deposit. And estimates are, if that deposit were fully developed, you're talking about 11 billion tons of mine waste that will have to be stored in perpetuity. And another way to say that is that has to be stored until the sun burns out. Hmm. I mean, you're talking this, this deposit, while it is quite large, while it is very large, is extremely low grade. It is very low grade in the valuable minerals. It's very high grade in sulfide. So to extract the valuable minerals from the waste, which is going to be, you know, 97, 98 percent plus is going to have to remain there on site. And it's such high sulfide content that exposed to air and water, that's going to create basically it's acid mine drainage, roughly equivalent of sulfuric acid. So you've got that. Their proposal is to build enormous tailings ponds behind enormous dams. We're talking miles long, the dams, 700 feet high and storing 11 billion tons of mine waste forever in an area that, oh, by the way, is very seismically active. Yeah. Now, I don't think anyone goes into a project, you know, thinking, hey, we're going to mess this up. No, there's no doubt that they think they can do it. I think that's just just about the highest level of hubris to really think you can control things like this. You know, I just look back and you've got a few factors that can cause things to go wrong. One is a natural disaster. That's like the Fukushima power plant over in, uh, over in Japan, um, the earthquake and the, and the resulting tsunami caused that a big problem. And I just said that we're dealing with an area in Alaska that's very earthquake prone. Um, and then the second is human error. Um, you know, despite the best engineering, despite the best intentions, you can't, you know, engineer your way out of every single risk. And the, the, the human error thing is like, look at the uh, deep water horizon and what, ha what that did in the Gulf of Mexico. So um, I think most people look at this and they say, yeah, you know, the mine would be very large and it could bring some benefits to a limited number of people for a limited period of time. But what exists there today has supported the residents of the region for millennia has supported a thriving commercial fishery that's not dwindling. It's in fact, you know, blowing records out of the water the last couple of years. And also um, to touch on, you know, something I think that this audience would like to hear about. I mean, it is God's honest truth. One of the finest bucket list sporting destinations on planet earth. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it, it's unreal. Alaska is pretty incredible sportsman's paradise. But I think even if you look at uh, look at Alaska and talk to folks who have been to different places, Bristol Bay, Southwest Alaska is widely regarded as the best of the best. Well, Alaska is number one on my bucket list. I haven't been up there yet. 
and uh, I'm, I'm anxious. And it's it's almost like I'd want to do it, just go up for about a year, just so I can experience all the things I keep hearing about with all the opportunity that's up there. Um, so I want to just back up a little minute, a little bit, and talk about some of those numbers that you brought up. So yeah, you you mentioned that there is a lot of metal there. So we're talking about copper and gold, right? As a mineral, the what they're trying to mine up there, but ninety. Eight percent of what they'll mine will be waste. I mean, that's so the percentage of that of copper and gold that they're going to be the stuff that they're pulling out of the ground. What they're looking for is a very small part, and then everything yes. else, ninety-eight percent plus of what they're going to pull out, they have to store forever. That that is true. It is a very large deposit, but it is extremely low grade. Hmm. Yeah, and and. And that is so, and when it, when we talk about how they store, like how are they planning to store it? It's, uh, it's ponds, basically tailings ponds. Yeah. Enormous tailings, ponds, lakes, lagoons, whatever you want to refer to it. Like I said, the, the dams that they're going to create to hold the, hold this stuff back. I mean, literally the plans are like 700 feet tall and several miles long. I mean, it's, it's and how would you like that hanging over the biggest salmon runs on earth yeah well and and hasn't there been something with uh migratory birds that have landed in ponds like that as well hasn't there been issues with that (laughs) yeah i think you're probably referring to the berkeley pit in butte montana where uh they they employ people i think these days to scare off the waterfowl that think they're going to take a break and land in that pit because once they land in there they usually don't make it out they all die yeah Yeah. So, so I mean, copper and gold, obviously people are always looking for copper and gold and for one, because it's valuable, uh, the copper, what, where would that, you know, what would they be doing with this? Where, where would the copper end up? You know, there's nothing that says, uh, that they have to have it processed and used in the United States of America. You know, resources like this are sold into the global market. So you can't say with hundred percent certainty, but there's, you know, pretty high likelihood given the location and, you know, ease of shipping in the Pacific, you know, who knows? I mean, is that stuff going to be bound for, you know, Asia, China? Mm. Potentially not America, of course. Yet we'd, yeah, we'd- I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing that says, you know, that they have to, if you take it out of America, you have to, you know, keep it in America. So this, this company is a Canadian company. And then there's been other investors that have walked away from this project. Yeah, the, the backers of, uh, of the Pebble Project is called the Pebble Limited Partnership, and they're a subsidiary of Hunter Dickinson, which is based out of Canada. Um, but over the years, they have had uh, financial partners who have you know, assisted with uh, exploration costs and, and other operating costs. But over the course of time, some of the biggest mining companies on earth have been involved, but no longer are. The ones that have walked away include Mitsubishi, um, a company called Anglo-American, which is one of the biggest mining companies in the world, uh, Rio Tinto. So these companies, some to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars invested in this project, you know, for one reason or another, decided, hey, we probably have more viable prospects that we can put our money toward in other places in the world um, that aren't going to face the problems that developing the pebble mine uh, is going to face. And all of those companies that I just mentioned no longer are part of the part of the pro- part of the project. Um, they've just cut their losses. How is this still a thing? I mean, when you have people like that backing out all the time, and then obviously this has been going on for a number of years now, a lot of opposition, a lot of local opposition to it. I'm, I'm just surprised that they're still trying to build the thing. Now, I want to bring up uh, a date that's coming up very close because right now the public, so anybody watching this or listening to this, they can comment and say, hey, do not do not build this mine, correct? That, that, is, that is correct. Um, right now, um, we talked a little bit about the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, um, is engaged in a process under the Clean Water Act that could see uh, two of the major river systems in Bristol Bay, two of which whose headwaters originate in the area of the pebble deposit, uh, could see these, these waters receive a much higher level of protection. Um, it's a very rarely used part of the Clean Water Act. Uh, the Clean Water Act has been law of the land since the 1970s. 
Mm-hmm. And under the Clean Water Act, uh, when, a, when a company wants to build a project like this that's going to have impacts toward water, um, the Army Corps of Engineers gets involved to review uh, what's called a Section 404 permit. And this could be anything from, you know, a small road project up to and including what we're talking about here, the Pebble Mine. You know, and the Army Corps looks at tens of thousands of these permit applications on an annual basis. And the EPA has oversight authority where in certain very rare instances, uh, this being one of them, they take a look at a project and say, you know what, what's being proposed here is certainly going to cause significant adverse impacts to the water resources and all that those water resources uh, support. So for that reason, EPA does have oversight authority and uh, veto authority on this permit. So the process that's going on right now Uh, The EPA is taking public comments until September 6th, and what they're proposing are a set of prohibitions um, on mine waste disposal in the immediate area of the pebble deposit, and also a series of restrictions um, in a broader geographic area that would uh, place some pretty severe restrictions on what sort of impacts could happen to uh, flowing water, to wetlands, lakes, and ponds, and uh, to to stream flow um, as far as you know reduction in you know, in the stream flow levels um, on a on a broader set of waters in Bristol Bay. So we're hopeful this process has been going on uh, for quite a long time. Um, in in 2010, locals in the region. Uh, tribes in the region, as well as uh, commercial fishermen, sport fishing operators, uh, was led by the tribal interests in the region, petitioned the EPA to get involved in using this part of the Clean Water Act. And as I said, it's pretty rarely used. As as I noted, tens of thousands of uh, permit applications are reviewed by the Army Corps every year. In the history of the Clean Water Act, what's being proposed in Bristol Bay uh, is, is something that the EPA has only done 13 times. So they only use it in the most extreme and the most rare of instances. And when you're talking about the resources that exist in Bristol Bay and the threat posed to those resources by something like Pebble, um, I think it's pretty clear most people agree that if you're going to use this tool anywhere, and it's a very surgical laser focused tool, if you're going to use it anywhere, this is a pretty good place to do so. Um, So the public can comment until uh, the 6th of September on these proposed restrictions. And the, uh, the, the website is stoppebblemine.org. Oh, you've got it right on the screen. Perfect. Um, so we, we have garnered support from folks all across the country. There's been a number of these public comment periods over the years. Um, like I said, the Army Corps or the, the EPA was petitioned back in 2010, and they undertook a process uh, from like 2014 to 2016 and that got delayed by litigation. The mining company sued uh, the federal government to, to halt this thing. And uh, we've, we've, we've emerged from the litigation uh, slowdown and now EPA, we're hoping they'll finish the job. And uh, this is the final opportunity for folks to comment. Over the years, we have had cumulatively millions of individuals who care about places like Alaska, who care about salmon, whether it's, you know, I love the taste and the, and, and the nutrition that wild salmon provides when I feed it to my family, to folks who love to go to Bristol Bay and, uh, you know, catch fish commercially. It's, it's thousands of small business owners basically is what you've got. All those permit holders there, a lot are from Alaska, a lot are from the Pacific Northwest, but you know, there's folks from Minnesota who have permits to fish up there. There's folks from you know, Montana, folks from Pennsylvania, folks from pretty much all over the country um, have direct jobs fishing in that commercial fishery. And then you've got, you know, the lodges and, and outfitter camps and those employ guides from all across the country as well. Um, that's obviously a more seasonal operation, but uh, it's it's something that whether you you know dream of going to Alaska someday or you uh, or you've been there before and you can't wait to go back, you know Bristol Bay is there. You go be- be- best of the best. There's not too many places where you can uh, you know <laughs> be be tight be tight with a 28 inch rainbow trout with brown bears in the river looking for salmon. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's a wild place, man, and it needs to be protected, and our waters need to be protected. And that's one thing we've we've really tried to to push hard here with, with our show is just how important keeping water clean and water conservation is uh, everywhere. And, you know, it's kind of the lifeblood of our planet, and we need to protect it, and not just for uh, you know people who like to fish and the wildlife, but just for for clean drinking water and and uh, healthy living across our planet so it's important to protect these places and and this project of course sounds familiar because a lot of people here back in minnesota know about this mine project up in the in the boundary waters and the boundary waters is still one of my favorite places on the planet and even even when the argument comes up every year about building cell phone towers up there or you you know allowing more motor motors to be used in different parts it, and as as nice it is to have a motor in some of those places i'm glad that there isn't you know you got to keep these places wild and clean and uh and protect them forever because if 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 not, they're all going to get destroyed. And then you're just not going to have places like this anymore. And you know a little bit about the boundary waters. You're from Minnesota, right, originally? Indeed. I grew up in uh, Gaylord, Minnesota, down by Mankato, went to school at St. Olaf in Northfield. So I uh, spent the first 21, 22 years of my life uh, living in Minnesota. Still uh, bang my head against the wall every year, follow the Vikings. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> And uh, and after Minnesota, I lived in South Dakota for uh, you know till I was just about fifty. So um, that no, seems like Boundary a natural. Waters is a place that is. I was just going to say that's a natural transition going from Minnesota to South Dakota. That's a that's that's uh, that's normal. I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think I think there's I think there's a pretty good uh, you know crossing of people going either direction in that equation. But um, yeah, I mean. I, I loved I loved South Dakota. I loved Pheasant Hunt and everything like that. So uh, it was good good time living there. My little brother actually is a pharmacist over in South Dakota in Aberdeen, up in the northeast part of the state. And quick quick tiny story on him. He went to school to be a pharmacist, and uh, to finish his school, he had his choice of the University of Minnesota or South Dakota State University. And he, honest to God, weighed it by saying, "Oh, downtown Twin Cities or." Biggest flyway in Central America, yes. in, in, uh, nor in biggest flyway in North America, plus really good fishing. <laughs> I think I'm going to go to Brookings. <laughs> that's, that's, that's smart. That is a smart move right there. I would, I would say the same thing, make the same decision. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but back, but back to the boundary waters, you, yeah. you, you brought that up and I totally sidetracked it. Sorry, man. I hijacked that. Darn. Um, no, my, my family, they took us to the, they took me and my brother to the boundary waters every single summer. You know, sometimes more than once. Went up there a couple times to Ely in the winter. Uh, I was probably about 10 years old and the lodge owner said, hey, you want to go on a sled dog ride? And oh, sweet. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, sure. So I rode in the sled and Bob, the lodge owner, you know, took the dogs out and we went whipping through these, through these roads and trails in the woods. And like a day later, he thought, oh, this kid knows what he's doing. Hey, Scott, do you want to take the dogs out? I'm like, <laughs> uh, I just I just rode along yesterday. About he said that's fine. They know the trail. They'll they'll just go right where they're supposed to go. Yeah. Okay. So ten year old Scott thinks. Oh, he thinks I can do it. Let's do it. So get across the get across the the county road, and we are off into the woods. And we are maybe two turns into this thing, and I'm off laying in the snow, and the dogs just kept going. <laughs> and 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 I thought, oh God. Are they going to get the sled and the ropes, you know, all tangled around some trees? So I walked the whole route oh only to get back, only to get back to the lodge. Everybody's wondering where Scott was because the dogs have been back for a long time. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That was my, that was, that was my last sled dog experience. <laughs> you should do it again. Uh, it's uh, I. I got, you know, I, I didn't quite have that situation. I've done it twice now. We filmed a couple TV shows up there around Ely and, and did it, uh, went fishing by sled dog, which was a lot of fun. And, um, the second time for we lake went up trout. for lake trout. Yeah. Well, the first time was for stream trout for brookies and, and splake. And then, uh, the second and rainbows. And then the second time we went for Lakers on, on, uh, uh, Burnside. And when we got done, I was with, we had, I think we had three three teams 
of sled dogs out there. And uh, I, so I had my, I was on my own, but basically I was in the middle and I just, the dogs just followed the trail like that and followed the guys in front. So for the most part, I was all right. So I was getting kind of cocky, like I'm pretty good at this dog sled thing. I know what I'm doing. And he's like, one of the guys is like, well, do you want to take the fun trail back? I was like, yeah, let's go. So we were going through the woods and pretty soon we were cooking and we were going around turns and bends like this. And pretty soon I was up like, at one point the sled was up in the air and came down and, and then I was going around a corner like this and I just couldn't hang on anymore. And I bailed and the dogs just kept, just kept right on trucking and uh, they caught up to the next sled. And then the guy running that one had to, had to run his and then jump into the other one and kind of fall into the other one and stop them both at the same time. Got it. Got most of it on camera. Cause the GoPros, I had GoPros on the sled and they kept going while I was still laying face down in the, in the snow back in the woods. So it was, uh, it was quite a, an experience and we had pretty good fishing up there too. So it was, it was pretty neat, you know, and that, uh, and, and then, so you, you obviously spent a lot of time in the boundary waters and, uh, and, and kind of know, what it means to protect that area as well. No, a- absolutely. I mean, you think the Boundary Waters, you think Bristol Bay, you think places like, you know, Yellowstone, the Grand Canyon. I mean, all of these are iconic places in America, iconic landscapes, um, amazing public lands. And the more we move into the future, you know, the seemingly fewer of those places there are in the world, yeah. which means those that which means those that remain uh, are that much more valuable. So, you know, Boundary Waters is the you know most heavily visited wilderness area in the in the country. So uh, it, it makes complete sense. And there's a lot of strong economic regions for protecting the Boundary Waters as well. Um, the tourism industry in Ely and on the Gunflint Trail and stuff like that, certainly. And there's folks who um, have chosen to make their homes in northeastern Minnesota because of the quality of life that uh, that it, that it gives them, and the fact that you can you know work remotely from a lot of places these days. I mean, places like that are going to be very attractive. So, yeah, I mean, I, we went to Basswood, we went to Gabro, mm-hmm. uh, all all those all those lakes. I mean, some of them are real close to where that Twin Metals mine is is proposed. So. That one hits. That one hits close to home. When you you know you hear people, particularly up on the you know on the range up in northern Minnesota, you know mining is a big part of the culture there, and it's mm-hmm. been a big part of uh, industry and and you know the the economy, and it obviously provides a lot of jobs, provides gives those people a, a way of life up there. But at, you know at, at at what risk? Obviously, with some of these mines, it's just not worth it. And and when you look at pebble mine in Alaska. And you talk about, well, it's going to provide all these jobs. Well, you can shoot that down right away when you talk about 15,000 jobs in the fishery. And that's a, that, those are, that's a, a sustainable economy. That's a sustainable, it's healthy for, for the planet. It's healthy for the fishery. It's providing a lot of jobs. It's a huge economic impact. So to me, it's a no brainer to, you know, that you can't, you can't tell me that, that this mine is going to provide, you know, that the, the job argument is a better one than what's already there. Yeah, I mean, I just think back, uh, Alaska has a has a former U.S. Senator, um, the late Ted Stevens, Hmm. and Senator Stevens was an ardent pro resource development uh, politician. And Senator Stevens, you know, he came out after looking at the pebble proposals, he came out and just said, you know what, this is the wrong mine in the wrong place. it's certainly something that could be beneficial, but the location is horrible for, for something like this. A former governor of Alaska, a guy named Jay Hammond, he actually uh, supposedly said that the only worst place that he could think of building the pebble mine would be in his living room. So, <laughs> um, and like I said, like I said, yeah, look at that. I mean, look at that. That's you know they call yeah. them leopard rainbows. They're, they're they're so spotted. I mean, they even have spots on their eyes for crying out loud. Um, those fish in Bristol Bay, I, I talked before when that picture of the bear was up there about, oh yeah, you can like be in a river with bears and you're tight to a 28, 28 inch rainbow trout. You know, you're going to catch that and you know, your guide will net it and you're going to be like, oh my God, that's the fish of my life. And your guide will have no qualms breaking your heart by telling you, yeah, that's a pretty nice fish, but it takes 30 to be a trophy here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that's how, that, that's how good it is. I mean, one of the first times 
Um, actually, the first time that I took my wife uh, on a trip and we went to Bristol Bay. Um, back in the early days of, uh, of doing what I do, I would spend the winter months, you know, sport show season, I would spend the winter months traveling the country from coast to coast. And every weekend I was somewhere else from Thursday through, you know, I'd come home on Monday and, you know, get some clean clothes in the suitcase and take off again to go to the next show. I got to play, I like to say, I got to play Johnny Appleseed running around Pebble Mine. And that's up to Bristol Bay. And, and we did a fly out and our guide happened to be a young guy from uh, from Minnesota. He's a he's a musky guide up uh, around uh, up around Leach and Mille Lacs. And he was our guide on a fly out trip down the Alaska Peninsula. And that day we caught a mess of king salmon Chinooks and every fish that Nikki caught was larger than any fish she had ever caught in her life prior to that day. Hmm. And for many years, the screensaver on my computer was <laughs> Adam, our guide, holding this, you know, close to 40 pound king salmon and Nikki standing next to him with this huge, huge smile on her face. And we got to the end of the day and she said, you know, when you're gone in the winter, all those, all those days and weeks, you know, it really does suck. It's not very easy. She said, but now that I've been here just once, I get it. This place is unreal. So, yeah. I mean, that's the kind that's the kind of experience that people have. That's the kind of experience that Bristol Bay provides, you know, just on the sporting side of things. And then you talk about everything else we that we discussed about what else it supports. And it is, as you already said, it's a it's a no brainer. It's hard to believe that so many people have had to work so hard for so long for something that seems so completely obvious. But here we are and we're getting, we believe, hopefully close to the end. And if we can get the EPA to finish these Clean Water Act protections, um, then we will secure lasting and durable protections for at least a certain part of Bristol Bay. And in the future, we'll look at, you know, options to expand those protections. So and that's you know, potential legislation down the line, but big focus right now, getting the EPA to finish the job. So that's what we're commenting right now is we're basically telling the EPA, yes, we want you to keep working on this. We, we want you to finish this process, provide the protection that uh, can provide and they have every opportunity to do this, and we're hopeful that by the end of 2022 or sometime early in 2023, we can get it done. All right. Very good. There's a website, stoppebblemindnow.org. Uh, we'll, we'll link it on our, on our website and on our social media, too, or if you're watching this, we'll put it down in the comments below. Uh, Scott Hayes, Sporting Outreach Director for Businesses for Bristol Bay. Uh, keep up the good work and uh, thanks for explaining the situation and giving us some time here on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. And before I sign off, I am going to say, you know, thanks to everyone across the country who has taken time out of their life to, you know, send a comment over the years because they truly all do matter. We need you one more time before September 6th. And I also want to give a big shout out to, uh, the sporting industry. I mean, it's been amazing to work with brands from the fishing side to the hunting side. I mean, I like to say I've got everybody from like fly rods to firearms on our side of saying, you know, let, let's protect Bristol Bay because, you know, on top of the fishing, it's a pretty darn good spot to, you know, chase caribou and moose and brown bear. Well, if you like the outdoors, this is a cause to get behind. Absolutely. And, uh, so let's get it stopped. September 6th is that deadline to put the comment in. And then you think uh, we could we could hear something about uh, what the EPA is going to do by the end of the year, early next year? Yeah, that's the timeline that we are uh, asking the EPA to act on. I mean, it's gone on far too long and they can they can do it in that timeline. We just have to prod them, I think. So let me ask you this, then, if they if they do what are, what are we asking them to do? They would, they would continue to push for protections. Is it what, is there more than what they've already talked about? And then would they, what would that do? Would that essentially shut this down? Would they try to mine somewhere else you think, or would that just completely end the conversation? Yeah. 
the the proposed restrictions that are on the table right now that people are commenting on would go a very long way to ensuring that these waters are protected and the pebble mine would not be able to be built. So that's what we're that that's what we're dealing with. I mean, once September 6th rolls around, that's the end of public comment period. The EPA will compile all those comments, look at other uh, stuff that they have learned over the last several months and then come out with their final proposal. StopPebbleMineNow.org. Uh, Scott, thanks a lot. If there's uh, any other any other messages you want us to help try to spread the word about, let me know. Thank you very much for having me. Devil's Lake is legendary, and this summer has been legendary for walleyes. Don't miss out. Call Haybell Heights Campground and Resort today to book one of their modern cabins on East Bay. The cabins are furnished with a full bathroom, kitchen, and all the amenities like high-speed internet and are clean following CDC guidelines. Staying at Haybell Heights gives you full access to a private boat launch, fish cleaning station, and beach area. Learn more at haybellheights.com. That's haybellheights.com. Plan your trip to legendary Devil's Lake today. All right, we obviously like to fish here in this state. We have a lot of water, a lot of lakes, uh, a lot of rivers, of course. And fishing those lakes uh, obviously come, becomes a priority for a lot of us. But there's a lot of things that go into those fishing opportunities from conservation, sustainability, uh, water, water quality, and then just what we do while we're on those lakes and, uh, and taking care of them. It's kind of an important job. It's not just about going out there catching fish, uh, whether you're releasing them or eating them. It's about taking care of of our of our resources here in Minnesota, and there's there's an effort that's been underway for a number of years that we've talked about here on the show uh, in the past, and we're going to talk about it again. And it's it's nice because it's a coalition of a few different of some of the you know some of the best fisheries really in the state, kind of getting together to take care of our resources. Uh, we're going to bring on Joe Henry right now from Lake of the Woods Tourism to talk about keep it clean. Joe, how you doing? Hey, Brett, doing well. Glad to have you back on again. This is kind of an important topic that probably should be talked about more often. Yeah, it really is. Well, you know, so ice fishing, as we all know, ice fishing has really, really blossomed as far as popularity goes across all of our ice belt lakes across the whole Midwest. And, you know, with more and more people getting on the ice, you know, with human beings, you're going to have some challenges with, you know, different things such as trash and, and uh, human waste and, and other things. So, you know, uh, um, about 10 years ago or so, um, Friends of Zippo Bay State Park were doing a cleanup on one of the beaches at Zippo Bay State Park, Brett, and they literally, the, the, the wind was blowing in the right way when, when the ice went off the lake, and they literally got trailers and trailers full of garbage hmm. that, that blew in. And the, the thought was, when we talked about this, the thought was, man, if the wind wasn't right, where would that garbage be going? And secondly, what about the garbage that doesn't float? Where did that go? So long story short, uh, Mike Hurst from Lake of the Woods Soil and Water Conservation District organized a team of stakeholders made up of, you know, of course, myself with Lake of the Woods Tourism. And, you know, there's other people in soil and water from the county, from the DNR Fisheries, DNR Enforcement, um, Roseau County, I mean, and uh, and some others. And, and basically, we all came together to work on keeping Lake of the Woods clean. And we call that effort Keep It Clean. And we've promoted that now for a number of years. Well, as we mentioned, this is this is a... A, a challenge, you know, with over two and a half million angling hours on Lake of the Woods, you, you know, I, I would say you have two groups of people. You have your people that just don't care and, and they're not real good about keeping trash off. They just don't care. Small, small percentage of the people. But then you also have a percentage of people that are really good meaning people, but maybe they don't plan ahead on, you know, where they're going to put their garbage. Maybe they, over the course of spending three nights on the ice, they put four garbage bags out and one of them blows away or gets covered by snow or freezes in. And mm -hmm. and maybe uh, one flies out of the pickup on the way off the lake or when they hit the, the local highway and get up to 55. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. But the bottom line is, the keep it clean effort, the, the, the mission statement is really um, to keep, you know, trash and human waste out of our waterways and off of our ice um, through an effort of, you know, education, promotion and enforcement. So we've been doing all this. Well, recently we had two other major walleye fisheries join us in this effort. And we're so pleased. Uh, we had, uh, you know, Upper and Lower Red Lake as well as Mille Lacs Lake. And, uh, you know, now the three fisheries are working together on this effort and it's it's very important effort 
Yeah, well, let's bring our other guests on. Uh, Robin Dwight is here, uh, and also Ann Bruciani. Bruciani, did I get it right? You did. You got it right. Ann Bruciani line. I, I, you know what? I had it before the show, and then I still got <laughs> nervous before I said it on the air, and I got this. Whatever. We got it. Thanks for joining us, uh, both of you, of course. All of you, thanks for joining us. It's an important topic. And I just want to say this off the top, and I, I, it's, I apologize for even bringing it up, but the fact that we have to talk about human waste and what we're what people should be doing it's it's been headlines the last couple of winters just what what's going on out there it's disgusting so this effort is more important than ever not just trash but uh and and joe to your point about having a plan because some of it's unintentional uh, you know some of it is accidental you, uh, something blowing out of the back of the truck or whatever but having a plan to clean up after yourself is uh is so important um Talk about, let's, Robin, let's start with you. Talk about how you decided to be uh, a part of this effort as well and what, what got you interested in it. Well, my husband and I live here in Waskish, which is ground zero for arguably the best walleye fishery in Minnesota. Oh, boy. <laughs> they argue, but they won't win that one with me. So we love angling. We love fishing. We're out there winter. We're out there during the summer. And um, we see with our own eyes the leftovers from human activity on the lakes. And we are very good friends with a number of the resort folks up here and the business owners. And we see their frustration. We hear their stories. Um, I got involved in that working with Zach Gutnick of the SWCD out of um, Beltrami County in Bemidji. And he said, you know, he called me one day and said, do you have any issues about trash up on, in your area on the lakes? And I said, well, how many hours do you have for no me boy. just to introduce <laughs> you to the problem? So we got, we got together and we started working on the issue as we understood it then. We went around to all the local folks and knocked on doors and um, had good conversations with those folks and had a round table up here at Upper Red Lake last fall where they got to come and tell us their stories. It, you know, it's pretty hard to help people if you don't know what the problem is. And the only way to learn is to talk to the people who live here and experience it day in, day out. So we did talk to resort owners, plow truck drivers, outfitters, businesses, and the story was the same. The consistent message was we're overwhelmed with the leftovers of human activity. We're dealing with it. We love people to come up here, but um, the fishery is great. But, I mean, this is a great place to bring your kids in the summer to enjoy the beaches and, and the wonderful, you know, tan and colored water. But. Uh, the waste is going to ruin it for us. And so that's what got myself and my husband interested in tackling the problem and joining up with the good folks like Joe and Mike and Ann and putting our heads together to come up, up with solutions. And uh, so here we are. We're reaching out to all other parties who are interested in this issue and wanting to work together with everyone to solve a statewide problem. You know, you, you almost have to see it. I think sometimes people have to see it to understand the severity of the issue. And when you see it, you you know, like, oh, my gosh. So what what steps are you taking there around uh, Upper Red there that uh, to, to help mitigate this issue? Well, we are taking steps. So we've been working on this uh, project. We have a pilot project that will be kicking off uh, at the beginning of December, right at Winter Fishing Opener up at Upper Red Lake. And um, we have... Uh, a contract with a licensed hauler to provide four dumpsters at four of the major resort locations up here so that fisher people can bring their human waste and trash off the ice and remove it and dispose of it separate from solid waste because right now it's mixed and the resorts have to deal with that and haul it by private haulers because the county doesn't want to of their workers um, exposed to contaminated waste. So this is what we're doing, uh, and the, Orland, or the Red River or the Red Lake Watershed District, pardon me, has been very generous to provide a grant funding for this pilot for one year. Hmm. So we will have dumpsters in place for people. We are also purchasing Santa bags for those folks that use uh, camping toilets in their fish houses, and those are colored bags. We'll provide messaging with that so that we give the people here the resources they need and the ability to do the right thing, which most people want to do. Further to that, we are uh, having engineers uh, talk to our local folks and businesses about the viability of having four seasons winterized dump stations for these wonderful RV styled fish houses that are now becoming so popular all across Minnesota. 
it's great to have these wonderful camping experiences out on the lake, whether you're fishing or just bringing your family up for a wonderful weekend. But currently, other than at Lake of the Woods, we do not have access to Four Seasons um, dump stations for RVs. That's very important because people who want to um, keep the lake clean, they need help with that. And our little community of Waskish has a population of around 150. So we need help with funding that infrastructure. So we're looking for state support and um, support from corporations and you name it, whoever wants to help us. We're, we're, we have open arms looking forward to that support. Well, there's no doubt that those, uh, uh, the, the wheelhouses and how they, you know, the ice castles and the other companies that are out there creating a camping experience on the lake, uh, the, it's the, that business has exploded in recent years and that's increased angling pressure, especially on some of those lakes up north that you have to travel a little bit more to. People are staying longer because they can camp right up there. They can haul their fish house right on the lake. They can stay right out there. But, you know, and, and I'm not trying... I don't want to target those manufacturing companies and give them something else to think about, but maybe that should be something that they should think about it as far as donating to uh, something like keep it clean since, you know, they're making money off all these people that are, that are uh, extending their stays out on some of these lakes, but that's, that's opening up uh, uh, another, another discussion for another time potentially, but the, it's an important thing to think about because the pressure is happening on all those lakes. And another lake that gets a ton of pressure just because of its proximity to the Twin Cities is Mille Lacs. And you're, you're getting those wheel, the wheelhouse anglers there, I'm sure, as well as just some of the, the people that are driving up for the day and coming back. So you're, you're dealing with probably a, a little bit of a different situation there on Mille Lacs. When did you get involved uh, with Keep It Clean? And what has it been like the last few winters there for you? All right. Uh well, I got involved with Keep It Clean in February of this year, and uh, it, it was because I'm with the Mille Lacs Area Community Foundation, and we were discussing feedback we were getting from business owners, community members, residents, about the increased amount of garbage and human waste on the ice during ice fishing season. And while I was researching that topic, I connected up with Mike Kirst at the Soil and Water Conservation District at Lake of the Woods, Joe Henry the tourism director, and they were more than generous in sharing information that they had, uh, reports that were done by the University of Minnesota that used Red Lake and Lake, of Lake Mille Lacs as comparison studies. And that gave our team quite a bit of information. We started talking to local business owners about bringing Keep It Clean to Mille Lacs, and they were enthusiastic in their support of it. And so we made the announcement, and right now we're sharing information, we're talking to resorts about their best practices, we're working collaboratively with Joe Henry and Robin Dwight and our regional Keep It Clean community partners, our Soil and Water Conservation District has gotten involved, our, uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is involved, and we're all trying to address how to raise awareness of the problem, talk about the problem, and give practical solutions on things people can do when they come to the lake to visit. Bring colored trash bags with you, pack in what you, or pack out what you brought in, make sure that you look around your fish house or your outdoor area and pick up any trash that may be on the ice. And if you see that somebody else has left garbage behind, take a moment and pick that up as well and at the end of the season when you're trying to remove your fish houses take the time to remove that blocking mm -hmm. uh, i had several residents sending me videos this spring of the amount of blocking washing up on their shores it was tremendous and they said in their bay as far as their eye could see for three straight days all that they saw coming in off that shore was wood blocking Interesting. Well, and that brings up a, maybe answers a question I was just going to ask, and this could be for the whole group is, is there, 
You know, is there one thing that you're seeing more than others when it comes to, you know, things being left behind by anglers? Is it white trash bags? Is it, is it wood blocks? Is there, is it, do you think that more is coming from the wheelhouse community or is it from, you know, guys in portables? Is there any sort of trend that you're seeing in what's being left behind that needs to be cleaned up from these people? I would, I would just say, you know, what, 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 what we're, what we're seeing and what we're hearing from um, some DNR folks that are on the ice all the time and things is that it seems that people that uh, are not working specifically with a resort fish house um, are, there, there's a little bit more uh, um, trash in that regard. And, and the only reason I say that is because I think with resort fish houses, when you're renting from a resort fish house, naturally the resort is checking on those people in that fish house two or three times a day. So naturally, the trash is going to get pulled by, by the ice guides on a consistent basis. Whereas, you know, when people are off on their own for a longer period of time, there's just, even if, if they don't mean to, there's just a higher chance of garbage to getting frozen in, left behind, covered with snow, blown away, you know, whatever the case might be. That, that would be my uh, takeaway so far. Yeah. And that, you know, and Andy brought up something too about leave no trace. I mean, that's been a, uh, we used to go to the boundary waters all the time. And that's what you were always taught about going into the wilderness areas is, is leave no trace. And why should it be any different if you go into Mille Lacs or, or Red or, or uh, any at Lake of the Woods, any of the lakes for that matter. And that, that brings up a bigger point of sustainability and protecting our, our fisheries. And I had this discussion with somebody else today. And, you know, w- w- when you start to talk about, um, you know, uh, recycling and environmental safe practices for for the environment. You you sometimes get some eye rolls from guys in the outdoor community when you start talking about lead sinkers or non toxic uh, fishing tackle things like that, and it's and, and even ammunition on the hunting side. But those are definitely things that are going to come and they're going to have to happen. Uh, plastics are terrible for the environment, and so much uh, that we use is plastic, whether it be trash bags or you know packaging that your tackle comes in a lot of times that gets left behind or blows out of the back of a pickup and that stuff just doesn't break down so from from leaving no trace and keeping it clean to cleaning up after yourself we're also going to have to look at some of these other uh, environmentally friendly practices when it comes to our time out in the wilderness and and people that are that live in the outdoor space generally also don't like to be told what to do. They like to self-police and, uh, and, and do things voluntarily. So I, I hope that there is a bigger movement towards this type of an attitude out there before it becomes mandated because then nobody likes to have mandates, but we're, we're going to have to, because we have to, we have to find a way to keep these areas clean and, uh, and sustainable. Um, so e- even the, the like colored garbage bags like that's so, um, Robin, were you saying something you're going to be handing out bags for people? We're making available to the pilot resorts, the four resorts, um, a bulk number of, um, Santa bags and these bags, whether they're, um, biodegradable or not, we're looking at a specific bag for human waste so that these bags are red, they're easy to see, and we're encouraging people that go through the pilots to use those bags to teach them um, better stewardship of the lake, um, how to use the bags, how to dispose of them, where to dispose of them, and they're brightly colored uh, with, the, with the suggestion that please do not leave those on the surface of the ice. Put them in some sort of a container or leave them in your vehicle because these bags tend to get lost. They tend to sink to the bottom. Some people tend to hide them under a snowbank for others to discover, unfortunately. Hmm. And so maybe this will help with a change of behavior. I just want to make a little shift in thinking about if it's easy for you to do it this way, yeah. Um, yeah. we're going to help you. Whether well, these things are going to have to, they're going to ha- just going to have to happen. And, and, and what have you been working with? Resorts like what's the reaction been with the resorts around Mille Lacs when it comes to this keep it clean program? Uh, well, they're excited about it, and I would say that they're frustrated. Uh, if somebody rents a fish house or goes out on their property and sticks garbage down the hole, which isn't uncommon, before they can prepare that fish house for a new guest, they've got to move it. There's a whole host of things, and then there's garbage that they can't retrieve down 
at the bottom. In fact, we were going to wait to announce Mille Lacs was going to join the Keep It Clean campaign this fall, and business owners started getting excited, and they started leaking that news, which is <laughs> last February. And the residents around the lake are eager for a solution uh, because in the spring, what what's left in some of it, right, washes up on shore. Others, it, it other garbage. It takes a long period of time. I was speaking with a DNR naturalist for Father Hennepin State Park and Cathio State Park just last week, and she'd gone out to conduct a loon survey on Lake Ojichi, uh, which. Malax flows into the Rum River, into this lake, and the amount of garbage was the worst she had seen in 10 years. She said they oh, recovered man. over a dozen five-gallon buckets. They were bringing in styrofoam sheeting that was likely used for insulation in fish houses, that there's a hike in the spring and summer that people love to do when they visit that Park, Cathio State Park, because it's so beautiful and pristine and the access to wildlife and the wildlife viewing is spectacular. She said she was so frustrated this year by the amount of trash she didn't even feel good about recommending that hike. And so it's not just that it affects our lakes, it affects our our rivers, it affects our wetlands, it affects our watershed areas in ways that people who maybe drop a beer bottle or a pop pop can or something don't think about. I never understood that for these people that like to go out into wilderness and enjoy a day of hiking or hunting or fishing that then just to throw their garbage like, ah, it's somebody, either somebody else has a job to pick it up for me or, ah, it's out here in the middle of nowhere. Nobody's ever going to see it again. And that's just, I just never understood that, that line of thinking. Um, Joe, what's what's next? Obviously, we have a lot of lakes, and as we expand, as this program expands with Red and and Mille Lacs, is there plans to keep it growing across the state to some of these other bodies of water? That's a great question. So right now, um, what we're trying to do is we are actually uh, uh, communicating with different agencies, different nonprofits, etc., to potentially take over the Keep It Clean program. Hmm. You know, we, we started initially up at Lake of the Woods. Now we have our two great partners in, in Upper and Lower Red and in Mille Lacs, right? Well, we've had, we've had inquiries from um, other lake associations, other lakes, other states to join Keep It Clean. But, you know, I'm tourism and, and, you know, Robin and Brian do something and Ann does something different and Mike Hurst is soil and water. You know, r- really, this, this is a much bigger thing. And really what we're looking to do right now is just get the message out. We're looking to... Um, make a difference on our three lakes initially. And then ultimately what we want to do is we want to be able to pass this keep a clean effort on to a proper organization or agency or whomever that can carry it even further. Things we're looking at right now are maintaining uh, integrity of messaging and, and, um, and logos and, you know, making sure that uh, we're on the same page as a group so that we don't, you, you know, uh, come across as unprofessional or mixed messages or anything like that. We're just trying to keep it going right now. And, we got all we can we do. I mean, this isn't my whole job, nor these folks' whole job. So we're trying to do it that way. And then in addition, Brett, one of the one of the things we're looking at, and I'll just let the cat out of the bag, but one of the things we're looking at is, you know, there's been discussion about a potential rule. What would happen, you know, if I had garbage in the summertime, and if I took my garbage and put it in a bag even, and if I tied a rope onto my boat with that garbage bag and threw my garbage bag over the boat into the water and towed that around all day, wouldn't you look at me kind of funny? Mm -hmm. When people are ice fishing, they think nothing of setting their trash or their garbage or whatever on the ice. Now, everybody has good intentions of bringing it out with them, or most people do anyway. But between wind and snow and being really tired from three days of ice fishing and leaving the next morning and it's 25 below zero, how hard are you going to look for trash around your fish house? I mean, you know, for all those things, what would happen if there was a a rule that, that, you know, you're not allowed to send any trash on today. So you either have it, have it, had to have it in your fish house, in a container, or in the back of your pickup truck. It, it, right off the bat, we would eliminate potentially 
tons and tons of garbage from from our lakes, from uh, you know, from on ice. So we're looking at different things. I, I'm not saying that's going to be something that's going to happen, but those are the kind of discussions that we're looking at, and we really see this as an ice belt problem across the whole Midwest, sure. not just Minnesota and not just our three lakes. Well, I'll tell you what, if you did make a rule like that, it would be it it come down to the, a mandated type situation again, and you'd have you'd have some people with some pretty strong reactions to it, despite the fact that it would probably do a whole lot of good. Uh, it's always hard when you, and then you'd have to have somebody there to enforce it, which is always tough too. But uh, well, what's, what's hard right now is, as far as enforcement goes, you know, Minnesota DNR enforcement, they're, they've been such good partners. They're all for keeping this trash off the lake. But the problem is the way the laws are written right now, the only way they can really do anything is if they literally catch you driving away with your fish house in the act and, and seeing a pile, if they find a pile of trash on the lake, there's really not much they can do about it. Yeah, you don't know who did it. Yeah, I, I well, all birds are drones, right? So we've got surveillance drones all over. Isn't that one of the yeah, government conspiracies? Right. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough situation, and obviously yeah. we need we need voluntary efforts from anglers that are out there to truly make a difference. And if it comes down to it, uh, there will be rules, especially if the EPA gets involved, you will have, uh, or yeah, that's what you're talking about. EPA or who, uh, well, or, or it could be, it could be EPA, it could be DNR. Yeah. It could be, uh, it could be local, uh, local, uh, counties that set certain rules for their County, which would include the lakes in their County. That might be a way to go, but those are things we're researching. I would just say this, that number one, having this kind of discussion is important because it gets people talking about it. It gets other important stakeholders on board discussing this. Um, you know, MinFish is an organization that uh, we had a chance to have some communication with. And, you know, MinFish is a very good, influential organization that talks about you know, uh, creating quality fishing opportunities in the state of Minnesota. You know, there's somebody that we're communicating with about this and and uh, they, they've been behind it so far. So, but, but I think having these conversations, working with resorts, I can tell you on Lake of the Woods right now, more and more resorts are, are actually... Uh, putting porta potties on the ice, yeah. which not only make it easy for people to use a restroom, but also we don't have plastic bags. Heck, some of the DNR biologists, Brett, have told us, you know, we are more concerned about the plastic bags than we are about human waste going into the water because at least that's organic. Right. Now, that's not good, but I mean, the plastic is even worse. And yeah. then, like Robin was talking about, we we have a couple of winter dump stations for, for uh, sleeper fish houses or RV type you know, because nowadays – they have bathrooms where they have the chemicals in it and they can actually have a heated holding tank so you can use your bathroom even in the winter because it's heated with those chemicals. There haven't been many instances, but there's literally been instances where all those chemicals and everything inside of that tank have been dumped on the ice or onto the land just leaving yeah. the lake. And that's just terrible. That is so harmful to the environment. Well, I think it's I think it's funny because I know when we, you know, when a, a bunch of us guys stay in one of those fish houses and we spend a night or two on the lake, there's usually a rule about number two in, inside the fish house. <laughs> it's usually, it's usually on a bucket in a bag somewhere outside because, uh, you know, just to make the rest of the trip uh, a little bit more enjoyable. <laughs> and then that usually, goes, life, that usually goes in the back, you know, it's wrapped up, tied up and goes into the back of the pickup. So next question then, if we're going to ask people to take care of their garbage or to have a plan in place, does Keep It Clean have, say, a page on their website where you can click on and say, this is what you can do to help? This is what you can do to make your next trip uh, a leave no trace type situation. Here's how you can keep your, here's how you can clean up after yourself on your next trip on the ice. You know, we do, we do have uh, points on our, uh, all three of our websites. And yeah, you know, the one thing I would say for folks is, Hey, the big deal, you know, everybody thinks like they know what to do, right? Even myself, I think I know what to do, but you know, when I hit the ice, I want to think about, all right, Hey, if I'm going for a few days on the ice, sleeping over, especially, all right, where am I going to bring my garbage? How am I going to keep track of it? How do I set it outside the house or do I keep it inside? Or do I put it in the back of my pickup truck and secure it? I mean, just little things like that make all the difference in the world. And yeah. I would let I would let my, you know, Ann and Robin, if you have anything to add about uh, the, the communication on your lakes as well. Yeah, yeah, we're working towards the same goals. We have information going out this fall with our pilot and we have our Upper Red Lake Association website with a Keep It Clean page, which people can go to and see what we're doing and... We carry on uh, keeping building relationships with the public. What is that website, Robin? 
Um, our website right now is the Upper Red Lake Area Association. And they have dot com and they have a keep it clean page on their website. Okay, great. And I love the decoys in the background there. That's great. Thanks. And <laughs> and and what about your website? Uh, our website is M L A C F for Malax Area Community Foundation dot org and we do have a dedicated keep it clean tab. We outline the five steps that people can take in managing their garbage. And then we also have a short list of some of the environmental impacts of not doing that. And you brought up something very controversial on the show. I just want to say in the background there, it looks like you have a muskie eating a walleye on the wall behind you. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The walleye was caught by my grandfather and the muskie. Ski was by my brother and my brother-in-law working together. Oh, it was cool. big fish to haul in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's great. By your grandfather, a, a, Mal- a Malax walleye? Yep, yep. That's awesome. That was his trophy fish. That's very cool. Well, Brett, well, you talk about, hey, you know, you talk about, you know, throwing gas on a fire and getting everybody <laughs> fired up, you know. So you're talking about muskies eating walleyes. We're talking about new laws, about not putting trash on the ice. What else can you bring up to boost uh, your, your listenership? Oh, I, I've got a list. <laughs> I don't know if you guys want to talk about it today, but um, we'll say we'll save the rest of that for another time. Uh, keep it clean. I think it's a great idea. I'm glad to see uh, uh, other organizations, other lakes and regions and areas getting involved in it. And we need to keep expanding it. Uh, keep up the, the good work. And uh, Joe, where do we find more information about Keep It Clean? Yeah, you know what? Uh, you can check out the Lake of the Woods Tourism website, of course, and that is lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Thank you very much, everybody. Northern Minnesota's Walleye Factory is a year-round world-class fishing destination. The perfect getaway this summer is just a short drive to Lake of the Woods. Fish Big Traverse Bay, the Rainy River, or visit the unique Northwest Angle. To catch big fish, you have to go where the big fish are. Plan your trip to Lake of the Woods at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. That's lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Did you know there are more than 1,000 lakes in Ottertail County? Yep, and I'm going to fish as many as I can. I'm an outdoorsy otter. Nothing beats a full day of fishing for me. The lakes of Ottertail County give me plenty of options to lower my boat and snag the perfect catch. Not an outdoorsy otter? No problem. Ottertail County has something for everyone. You just need to find your inner otter. To find your inner otter, go to ottertaillakescountry.com. All right, now it's time to talk about Panfish Paradise in Otter Tail Lakes Country with Garrett Sphere from Slab Seeker Fishing. Garrett, how you doing, man? Hey, doing great. How are you guys? I'm doing all right. Dan's doing all right, Thanks I'm sure. You. Thanks doing, for Dan? having me on the show. I sure appreciate it. Yeah, you bet, man. Thanks uh, Thanks for coming on. I want to talk to you a little bit about what you've been up to, because I know you've been out having some uh, some pretty cool adventures, including uh, being on the Brule and chasing some browns around. Uh, but I want to start with, with with panfish right now in Ottertail Lakes country. Um, how's, how's fishing been? And, and if people were going to go out there, say, this weekend, what would you look for to start targeting, you know, maybe, say, crappies? Um, you know, those crappies, we're still catching them. The water temps are still pretty high. And so we're still catching them in the, in the cabbage weed, any of that broad leaf cabbage with the nice wide leaves are holding a bunch of fish. Uh, the best, best way to uh, target them this time of year is trolling. You know, if you can keep your boat moving with your uh, bow mount or your, your trolling motor real slow around a mile an hour, you know, no faster than about 1.2 and no slower than about 0.8. Um, you're going to you're and uh, keep putting on some miles on the, the deep weed edge. You're going to hit some pockets of that nice broadleaf stuff, and uh, you're going to have some success. So if you were to go out to any lake in Ottertail County, I'd just get, get yourself on the deep weed edge and, and troll with uh, plastics. You know, this is the time of year when there's really no need to spend a bunch of money and have minnows in the boat. I would just troll with plastics. Um, I really like, like, a Roadrunner jig, something with a – a little flicker blade on the bottom of the jig head gives you a little more flash. But uh, some days you're going to find those fish kind of suspended off the deep weed edge. And uh, they're, they're higher up in the water column, um, especially in the evenings. But uh, don't be afraid to, you know, get right up on some of that uh, cabbage and, and those 
coontail and the, those weeds as well on that deep deep weed line. And, uh, during the afternoon, you're going to find most of those fish right up in, in that stuff. And so if you can troll on top of it, cover some ground. And then, you know, it's been kind of weird. Normally this time of year, the fish are really spread out, but uh, lately they've kind of all been in similar spots too. So then once you hit some fish, you can hit the spot lock and kind of fan cast out, you know, and cover some uh, cover cover some ground in that area where you're hitting those fish and, and usually pick off quite a few more. You know, live bait is always nice, especially if your fish are finicky. But, man, artificial plastics or, you know, hard baits or whatever, whatever you like to use – the, they've come they've come so far and have become so effective it's nice we fish with plastics now all the time whether it's putting a plastic on a jig or something like that or just using some of those pre-rigged ones but uh it's so nice not to have to deal with live bait garrett yeah you know we talked uh, the other day me and Corey studer from vexlar about that the other day it popped up in his facebook memories that him and i had uh went and caught a bunch of big bluegills in my boat and he said we'll have to do that again it's been a long time and he said that remember how amazed you were at how well i did on plastic that day <laughs> you know, he came out in my boat and he bought a whole bunch of plastics and uh you know he was really dialed into that and at the time i was you know really using live bait primarily so i was really shocked he did as well as he did on these these plastic baits and now that's uh, such a big part of my arsenal and really all i it's it's pretty rare for me to go and get live live bait on the water depending on what we're doing i mean there, like you said there's times when you really need it but especially like trolling for these crappies because the problem is is when we're doing this we're trolling these expansive flats of cabbage and you'll get on these flats and uh you know i'm, I'm hitting that cabbage quite a bit with, with customers are with their jigs and with plastic on we can give that thing a pop pop it off the weed and uh just leave it out there with all the confidence in the world that the plastic is still in great shape and we're, we're still hunting for fish you know, if you have live bait on, you got to reel that in and check it every time you hit a weed. You can't just give it a good rip and uh, and keep trolling. You know, so uh, just the efficiency of you know how you can cover water without having to keep keep you know, and, and it's even gotten that way in the spring for me. There there used to be times when you know shallow spring crappies and really cold water. You know how finicky those things can be sometimes. Where I would still go out and fill the angle full of crappie minnows, so we had them if we needed them. But, you know, lately, the last couple of years, I think I've proven time and time again to customers. Uh, you know, I've had this spring, I even had some customers that bought their own and brought them because I had kind of expressed to them before the trip that I, I'm not a live bait guy. And I think I've proved to them time and time again that, uh, you know, you'll somebody with plastics will outfish the person with live bait at least three fish to one, even in real cold spring conditions. And a lot of it is just with the efficiency that you can get back out there, you know, there. They're, they got the scoop in the minnow bucket. It takes them, you know, um, two minutes to dig out a minnow and get it on the hook where I, I catch a fish, I unhook it, let it go or throw it in the live well, and I'm fired right back out there in the spot again, you know. I've got two so can- two stories about plastics that I like to tell. And one was uh, we were walleye fishing last fall, and creek chubs are normally kind of the go-to for a lot of guys uh, where we fish. And we had we had plastics. And we were out fishing the guys with live bait around us, which which I was kind of surprised about. And then earlier this year, Garrett, we went and we went bass fishing. And while we were bass fishing, we decided to switch gears and fish for some panfish. There's some big bluegills, but we didn't really bring panfish gear. I guess I didn't really have a lot of small jigs or anything like that. So we were, Dan, what were those? Like quarter ounce jigs or something like that with uh Four, four inch. Straight up what I use to walleye fish. Walleye, yeah, walleye gear. So big jigs and four inch plastics, and we were catching bluegills on them. Big bluegills. Jigging on the bottom. That's awesome. It, it felt like walleye fishing, but uh, they were so aggressive, and they were they were big fish too, and they were, they were eating those big plastics. So, you know, it just it's just one of those things where when it comes to fishing, sometimes just thinking completely outside of the box will work, and when you think you got them figured out, you realize they got they, you don't have them figured out. So let's, I got to ask you that. Let's talk about that for a second. So how, you know, you guys are both pretty hardcore walleye anglers. How big of a you found the rural water <laughs> more plastic Wait a minute. Garrett. hey garrett can you hear us you you cut yeah. out you cut yeah, out yeah. there so start that start that over again saying you guys are big walleye guys say that again 
Yeah, you you know, you guys are big walleye anglers. Like, how big of a role do artificials like plastic baits play, you know, into your walleye fishing? You know, like when you're pitching jigs versus, you know, when you're, you know, it, are you buying less minnows than you used to? Do you not buy minnows ever? I mean, how? I, I really haven't been buying them. I mean, we, we had some last winter, I know, when, when we were ice fishing. But I switched to, uh, I was using a lipless crankbait that one weekend that we went out there and smashed walleyes on that. Uh, but yeah, in the summer when we're pitching jigs, it's all plastics. All in the spring, fishing. you know, in the spring in the cold water, <clears throat> I'll start my season with plastics. Like down in the river, like be fishing, I just happen to have one right here because I have plastics coming out of my ears these days. But if it gets finicky, you know, we'll still keep a scoop of minnows in just in case. Um, but otherwise, night crawler still happens a lot in the summer. But, yeah, it's either oh, yeah. jigging wraps or, like, the last few days we've been walleye fishing, and I haven't even thought about using a minnow. It's been all plastic. If it's, we're pulling spinners, I like I still like using crawlers, yeah. pulling spinners in the summer. But uh, but otherwise, yeah. You know, I have a good buddy who is – the reason I wanted to ask it is I have a good buddy who is, a, you know, a pretty high-end walleye touring pro. And him and I had this conversation recently, and it's just interesting to hear that, you know, he likes to pull spinners with uh, worm weight on top of the weeds for uh, for uh, walleyes. And, you know, that was always a presentation where he'd use a half a night crawler. And he said now he uses those gulp ones mm-hmm. kind of for the same reason, like when we're crappie fishing, because he can hit a weed, pop it off of the weed. And he knows he doesn't have to look at that half a night crawler. That gulp crawler is still on there, and he's right back to throw it back in the rod holder and keep trolling, you know. The, the, the artificials have gotten so good at, at replicating the look of live bait, but also the, that taste and smell. And when you can, have, when you can ha- have all of those things, they can be really effective. So we're not <laughs> – is it raining, Garrett? Yeah, it's truly unbelievable. Yeah, sorry, I have kind of a big <laughs> rainstorm here all of a <laughs> You look scared. <laughs> 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 Uh, that's funny. All right. Well, we'll let you. We'll let you get back. We'll, we'll let you concentrate on driving, um, and we'll. T- I'll tell you what. We'll talk about Brule and the Browns next week here on the show. It's Garrett Sphere, uh, Slab Seeker Fishing. Thanks for the time today on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, buddy. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to sportingjournalradio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to sportingjournalradio.com.